Well, hello and welcome to Temporary Australians. I'm Jonesy. And I'm Hersey. It's another great day, Greg. Look at this sun is shining. It's a ripper, mate. Glad to be riding. What's coming out? Mate, we find out how the cops are treating bikers up in Queensland. Very well, I'd imagine. Not as well as we'd like. And I've got a great sled that we'd like in our shed. If you like German stuff, I think I've kind of given it away. I think you have. Well, let's get into it. All right, one thing though, Greg. Have you seen where I parked my bike? Uh, is it over there? Thanks, mate. Also coming up on the show, Ralph explains why he rides with a disability. We look at the future of custom motorcycles in Australia. We check out Darwin's purpose-built motorcycle centre. We examine how the dirt drag started in Western Australia. We get the good oil on Heavy Duty magazine and take a closer look at the Queensland anti-rights laws. Riding in Queensland used to be a carefree and pleasant experience. Then came the anti-rights laws and everything changed. We went to bed on a Thursday night and on a Friday morning we awoke criminals. My kids uh, switched the TV on. Their dad was a murderer, a drug dealer. Um, yeah, the, the family was, was in turmoil. <clears throat> then I came to work to find out that they declared uh, tattoo studios at one of their targets. So I'm a tattoo, I've been a tattooist for 25 years. So they've attacked my family, my livelihood. And then on the club aspect of things too, all my brothers, it's uh, totally turned my world upside down. We're not on the list of criminal gangs as such, but we're stopped often. Um, general public wanting to do the right thing and, and the advertising campaigns that have encouraged them to, to do that means that they will uh, ring up if we're at a service station, if we're at a restaurant, if, if we're at a cafe, or even if we're on the road, you know, so often we're apprehended just by, uh, you know, by the fact that we're together and that we're riding along. I understand one of your nominees out of Toowoomba got handcuffed. He was assumed to be an associate and uh, knew his rights and the officer didn't like that and I believe, you know, stuck him in handcuffs to sort it out. One of the things that's happened in Queensland, unfortunately, I think is that Campbell Newman has been very quick to demonise his opponents, uh, lawyers, judges, um, and now PR companies too, and you've had personal experience with this. Yeah, well, I, I really think that he has introduced bad laws and now he is struggling to try and find a way out of it. And the way that he's been doing that is by demonising anyone who opposes what he's done and uh, calling them criminals. The fact is that I'm not actually working for motorcycle clubs, um, which was what he was alleging. And he was using really loaded language by saying that, you know, PR firms are working for criminal gangs. Do you have the same sort of issues over there in the UK? No, we don't have the same kind of, uh, you know, I thought, I thought Britain was a, was a nanny state until I came here. There's a very small percentage of people who are doing very bad things. And that's, you know, they're proper, not very nice people. But there are plenty of laws already and, and they should use those laws to get to arrest and get rid of those people. Absolutely, we don't need extra laws for that. And, and, by, and by calling them bikies, we are, we are, we are stigmatising everybody. And so anybody who doesn't know anything about bikes or whatever, so at this point now in, in Queensland, anybody who drives on a scooter or, or a sports bike or any bike, they go, oh my God, there's a bikey, they must be dangerous. Australian Motorcycle Council has been quite vocal in its opposition to the anti-rights laws in Queensland. And you've even um, set up a fighting fund to help uh, with the High Court Challenge. Predominantly our concern has been the effect that the laws are having on broader motorcycling. So the fact that people are targeted simply because of how they look and they look and they have the riding on a motorcycle, um, in simple terms, it's just outrageous. It honestly is. We're at the Parkerville Hotel talking to hunter rider Ralph, um, who's remarkable because he's been able to ride uh, for many years uh, with a serious disability. Uh, tell us about your arm, mate. Well, I was born with my right arm the way it is now. I've never known any difference and I've always tried to be the same as everybody else. Whatever they can do, I try to do the same. And many years ago, I got told I'd never be able to ride a bike. I tried to prove everybody wrong. And I'm here with everybody from an motorcycle group riding a bike and it's amazing. When you started, uh, did you find it daunting having to try and figure out how to do it? Yeah, it was, it was difficult because um, not having a thumb, I had to try to learn to control the, the, the accelerator um, without having to let it go all the time. 
And the main part that I had a problem with, and I still have a little bit of a problem with, is, is the front brake. So um, I've actually got to let go of the throttle to pull the front brake on. So I don't ride fast, I've got, I've got a cruiser, and I just enjoy riding the bike. So you haven't had to modify the bike at all to make no, it roadworthy? No, not at all. Just, um, I thought about it, but if I can do what you can do, and prove to everybody that I can do it, I'm happy with myself. So what is it about riding that's made you so determined to be able to do it? I, I, don't, I don't really know. It's just something that, um, to try to be an individual. Nobody needs to be like everybody else. So really what you're saying is that you're fiercely independent and you just want to be able to do whatever you want to do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. For 60 years, BMW had been making flat twin motorcycles with huge success, but in 1983 they set the world on fire when they made a flat four and gave us the K100. The Germans had always been innovators, but they looked at the Japanese and the success that Honda had with the Goldwing engine. They also looked to Peugeot to get some inspiration. And they really had some cool models to choose from. Four, in fact. There was the K100, the K100 RS, the K100 RT, and the K100 LT. The K100, though, was ahead of its time. Big shaft drive, also it had a dry clutch, so it had a half-life of a thousand years engine-wise. And what about this, the stereo? You get this, and, and this is what I love about the Germans. They think about stuff like this. So you slide your little thing in there, and then you can control your, your tape deck, which is just down here, and you can listen to your favourite music. Ah, yeah, yeah. Although the imposing fairing in your rear view mirror usually meant the cops were on your case because they loved these things in the 80s. And what we seem to forget is a lot of tourers these days have tons of storage, but this was the forerunner. You gotta put your Lederhausen in this side and your Steiner beer and your Bratwurst in the top and ride all the way to Frankfurt, carrying Frankfurts. And the Germans were just so cutting edge with stuff. The single swing arm, which kind of looked pretty cool and easy to get the rear wheel off. You know, they had Nina with 99 Luft balloons, and this, that was just a headband. The K100 was a bit of a sales success, stemming the losses to the Japanese and changing the media and public perception of BMW. I heard someone say once that 80% of all the K100s made are still on the road. That's remarkable. This one has 100,000 Ks on it. It's hardly been run in. That's why the K100 BMW is a sled we'd love in our shed. Tony, one of the big issues in motorcycling is whether or not we're going to be able to custom motorcycles uh, in the future in New South Wales. Yeah, I think the future's looking bright, actually. It's, it's a bit, going to be a bit easier than it has been in the past, really. I guess there's always been the sense you could customise anything and make it a work of art. But whether you can get it registered is really the issue. Yeah, and look, there'll always be certain grey areas around it. They've been doing a lot of work on clarifying the laws, so the laws themselves won't be that different, but it'll be a lot clearer for people. If you built a bike just like the ones you're importing, would it be easy to get it registered? Yes, there's a bit of uh, government paperwork, of course, but uh, yes, it can be done. I mean, we've built a couple of bikes here from scratch, it's, it's by no means impossible. There are, there are people that the government recommend that you go to help you do this, and you pay for it, of course. And uh, these people are certified engineers, and uh, really they're there so people don't have to go to the government with every little problem. How do they determine what standards? Is it the, the motor that you use, or is it a combination of all the parts? A bike or a car will normally be dated off its chassis rather than its engine. So if it's a brand new, completely custom chassis, then it's an individually constructed vehicle. But if it's an original, let's say Harley-Davidson chassis, for instance, and you modify the, a few things around the chassis, you've still got a, a modified production vehicle. We've had instances where, here where people have imported uh, fully built bikes from America and they think they're just going to be able to take it down to the local police traffic, get it registered and ride off. It's not the case. You, you have to have everything that complies pretty much the same as the Australian design rules. It has to come up to that standard 
before you can ride it safely on the road here. Well, there are some people who are building them with no intention of ever registering the things, whatever turns you on, I guess. But it, it will be possible to go a, a fair way with the bike and still have it registered without, you know, without getting too silly. I mean, it's, you can go and have fun with it out on the road as well, you know, instead of just trailering it everywhere. How popular a ship is dirt drags in Western Australia? Uh, dirt drags has gotten to be pretty popular over the last few years. I've been doing it for about seven years myself. And uh, once the club started doing the shows and the shows were getting bigger, we got more and more people turning up. Nowadays in an event, you could probably look at about six to 900 people attending a show. Is there any difference between sand drags and dirt drags? No, it's exactly the same thing. Um, some clubs call it dirt drag, some clubs call it sand drags. I mean, obviously every track's different. Uh, you can have tracks that are harder, you've got tracks that are softer and fluffier. Um, track conditions can change during the day's racing. If you get rain, well, on the smaller bikes, you've got to start changing sprockets and rear wheels and that sort of thing to suit the conditions. Is there much uh, competition over here? Is it formalised or is it more just club shows and club events? Uh, it's not, not formalised as such. Um, it's very competitive of, you know, amongst individuals. Um, everyone's sort of trying to outdo each other. But uh, you also have two classes. You've got, you've got the bikes that have got sponsorships and they're worth a fair bit of money. And then you've got bikes that are built in people's sheds like this or even in their lounge rooms. At a typical race meeting, would you have a couple of bikes dragging off each other or is it done on times? No, it's side-by-side uh, -side racing. Uh, we have uh, electronic lights and uh, timing systems, so you do run off your times, but it's still the good old one against one. I have been told that um, drags on the, on the tar, um, there's a lot of club guys that get involved in that. Is it the same over here in dirt drags? Oh, definitely. Um, the dirt drags was basically started by the 1% clubs. Um, this was a long time before before I was on the scene, but um, you know, fellas they used to go away for overnighters and that, and there'd be a paddock with no trees, so they'd all get pissed up, jump on their bikes, and start dragging each other, and uh, it sort of evolved from that. Our shop here has supports nine franchises of, of motorcycles, um, so we, we've pretty much got near on everything, every every base of, of motorcycling or every aspect of it covered in what we do, uh, in what we can supply and, and support with our, our backup and workshop. This is clearly a purpose-built operation. Uh, can you tell us some of the things you had to consider as you were planning this? All weather access is, is an issue with our wet season when, when it's raining, so where our um, goods inwards department is, is all under roof, so we, we can unload and, and load bikes out of the weather. We have a wonderful new workshop in there that, that's air conditioned so that in the wet season and it gets all sticky and, and not a nice place to work outdoors, we can roll down the roller doors and give our techs a, a reasonable comfort level while they're, they're working on our bikes. We've got solar panels on the roof, which generates power to try and minimise our, our, our power expenditure. And that's quite effective from what I hear. It's saving a fortune and you're even on selling some of the current that you save. And this is good, that's right. A Sunday, like Sundays that we're closed and, and after hours that we're closed and it's still daylight hours, we're actually feeding power into the grid, slowing our metre and, and sometimes, I believe, even reversing it. Now, how big a problem is the red dust here? Depends how pedantic you are at keeping your bike clean, <laughs> wanting your bike looking good. Um, if you have a white bike and it's red, <laughs> I'd say you yeah. probably want to wash it regularly. Yeah. A lot of construction going on all around us. We, we're getting quite hammered actually with, um, with, with dust in the air at the moment, so it makes it hard to keep all of our, our new stuff outside looking shiny and sparkly and new. Businesses like this are able to be sustained by the demand? It, it does help that we're a multi-franchise organisation. I think we would struggle trying to, to support ourselves with single brand stuff because we just don't have the population that will in Darwin that, that can support a, a single brand dealership. Tell us a bit about Heavy Duty. How long's it been going? 
It was actually originally called the uh, Harley Buyer's Guide and it was published by Harley City in Brunswick, Victoria. They did two issues of that. And uh, then Chris went out on his own, went and borrowed some money and started up Heavy Duty. So it actually came out 1991. So it's been going now for 22 years. Now besides the magazine, you've also verged into touring overseas and yep. even television. Yeah, we, uh, we started doing some tours um, every... We did occasional tours back in the late 90s, and then in 2003, Harley's 100th anniversary came along. So we did a big tour. We all did a pilgrimage, all heavy-duty readers and, and their mates. Uh, we all travelled to the US, took our own bikes, shipped them over, and we all rode to Milwaukee and back across the US. And it was the, it was the biggest... the biggest fun that uh, I think most people have ever had. So how did you go um, getting into television? Steve Dundon from um, Brand New Media approached me and said, look, we'd really like to put your magazine on screen. And I said, look, that sounds great. Uh, let's have a crack at it. As it turned out, it was a little bit more complicated than that. So what we've done now is that Steve's doing HDTV and we are supporting him and he supports us. So we, we co-promote each other. It's a cross-promotion between the two mediums and it's working very well. This is the way modern modern media works and it's working out very, very nicely. Um, so any plans in the future? Next year is the 75th anniversary of Sturgis. So um, I think most tour companies around the world will be putting on extra tours to cover that. Sturgis, by the way, the City Council of Sturgis are expecting in excess of 700,000 people. Now normally they would get Five to 550,000 anyway, but they're expecting a lot more. So it's going to be a really big deal. Um, if people are planning on going, whether they're going to go with a tour company or just by themselves, they should start putting some research in now because it's going to be very, very busy. When the residents of Queensland went to bed late in 2013, little did they realise that Premier Campbell Newman was about to introduce laws that flew in the face of legal practice in Australia. Anti-rights laws are, are the most terrifying, scary laws around. They're affecting everybody. They're not affecting just motorcyclists. Really, there's, there's no mention of motorcycles again in, in that legislation. What it is, is the government's taken it upon themselves to declare groups of people, criminal organisations, without any evidence whatsoever and without going through a court of law. I guess we're shocked, you know, with, with the extremity of the laws that are in place in Queensland at the moment. Um, you know, two things are, are pretty obvious there, which are two basic rights that have been taken away from individuals. One is the uh, right to uh, associate, the right to be able to ride and, and uh, have friendships with whoever you choose to have friendships with. The other thing is the fact that you know people are being assumed guilty um, before they're even proven innocent. So there's an assumption of guilt just because you belong, you may belong, you may be an associate, and you know the whole association thing is is as broad as being on one ride with a club that's been declared a, a criminal. Um, outlaw gang. They have attacked my family, my livelihood, and then on the club aspect of things too, all my brothers, it's uh, totally turned my world upside down. So far they've got blokes buying ice cream for their kids on sur in Surfers Paradise. Uh, another, another group up at Yandina have, having a counter meal. And one of them was a librarian. And, and she, she's a lady and they called her a club member. One of the issues that particularly concerns me as an Australian is um, the process in which these laws came into being, in which the government actually declared certain organisations as criminal organisations without it going through the courts. Well, governments are always answerable in the end to the people, uh, and I think that's the ultimate test. Um, governments will and do have the capacity to make laws um, as long as they're constitutional. So I'd say to people, if you're not happy, there are different ways to express it. The grassroots swell of people behind us with, with this anti-rights law, mate, we've, we've never seen it before. We have never seen it before. Mums, dads, granddads, grandmas, kids, kids waving out of the cars because they all of a sudden see us, mate. Pe people aren't as, as, as asleep at the wheel this time around as they were last time. I think it's been messy and I think the laws are uh, unworkable. I think some of the things we've seen today have just looked a bit messy to me. Um, I, again, look, we support our police and we want them to be doing their job. We want to make sure they're properly resourced, make sure they can you know, keep us all safe. Um, but we don't want laws that, you know, without consultation, mean that a whole heap of people are the target of attention uh, when they're really just not doing anything at all. 
Well, that was a great show. I think that's the best one we've ever done. It went well. I enjoyed it. <laughs> it went well. I enjoyed it. If Greg enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be back next week, of course. And if you want some more deets about Temporary Australians, go to our website, temporaryaustralians.com.au. There's a world of entertainment. There's videos. You can buy the DVD. You can get a lot of Hirsty's hair. Great. You didn't tell me about that, mate. Uh, uh, hang on. <laughs> Thank you. It's right there. We'll catch you next week on Temporary Australians. Shiny side up. <laughs>